In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Today is Reformation Sunday, the Feast of the Reformation, that being the Sunday closest to October 31st, All Hallows' Eve, when a friar, priest, and university professor named Martin Luther posted 95 theses challenging the doctrine of indulgences as it was understood by the Western Catholic Church in his day, and as it is still understood for the most part in the Roman Catholic Church of our day. Luther himself was not yet a Lutheran. His rediscovery of the pure gospel, that the just shall live by faith and only by faith in Jesus Christ, still lay a few years in his future. But he was close enough to this understanding, and there was enough wrong with the doctrine of indulgences, especially the way they were being sold in his time, that he was able to articulate some very serious and biblically-based objections. Objections that he himself came to understand better as the controversy unfolded. This was the beginning of the Reformation, to which we, 500 years later, owe our own wonderfully clear and biblical teachings on the most important topic in human experience, namely the justification of the sinner before God. And when I say 500 years, I mean exactly 500 years later. I couldn't have meant it so exactly last year, and I won't be able to mean it so exactly next year. Luther posted the theses on October 31st, 1517, and this coming Tuesday is October 31st, 2017. It's the 500th anniversary, and it's being celebrated around the world. It's a fairly momentous occasion. People have been preparing for this date for several years beforehand, especially in Germany where Luther has the status of a folk hero. Why the 500th and not the 501st, we might ask? 501 is more. Well, you know how it is. The human mind adores big, round numbers. And 500 is a very round number and very big. If Luther could have looked forward to the future and seen us today, he wouldn't have believed it. He didn't think this old world had that much time left in it. But once he got over the surprise, he would be sad, and he would be angry. Not at what we are doing here today, but at the way his name and the reformation that he kicked off have been co-opted and betrayed by so many of the people who are celebrating this anniversary right now. Because most of them do not hold dear the doctrines that he put his life on the line for. His legacy has been twisted and perverted even by, and especially by, church bodies that continue to call themselves Lutheran. Luther would lament, if he could see it, that he had thrown everything he had, all of his best insults and challenges and accusations, at the papists, when here he was finding something that might be even worse. Though it claims me as a father, and now what do I have left to throw at it? The reason this anniversary is such a big event, observed far beyond the borders of our confession, is that Luther is remembered as a great man and a reformer for many different reasons, quite a few of which have little to nothing to do with what the man himself believed and cared so passionately about. He is given credit for so many things that happened in the transition from the medieval world to the modern world, including many things that would have appalled him just because he is seen as the one who is brave enough to nudge the first domino. He is celebrated, for instance, for breaking the stranglehold that the Pope and the Church had on intellectual life and championing the freedom of the individual against all comers, against anyone who would encroach on it. But the celebrators so often forget or gloss over the rock on which Luther stood when he took this bold stand, the authority to which he chained himself in order that he might have such freedom. When he stood at the Council of Worms, at the Diet of Worms, before the Holy Roman Emperor and the papal representatives and defied them and said he would not recant, he didn't just say, I will not recant. He said, I cannot and will not recant. Why? 
my conscience is held captive to the word of God. But point this out to many of those who are toasting Luther today, and they will say, well, that was the first step. We are honoring him for taking the first step. First, freedom from the church, then freedom from the word of God. And we are beginning to see today, then freedom also from the law of God as enforced by nature. Until the only real beings in the universe who are worthy of the name God will be us. Yes, they might say, Luther would have hated the rest of the steps that are so dear to us, but say lovey, he was useful. We tout him for what he destroyed, not for what he built, for the eventual results of his actions, not what he wanted to achieve by them. And we might say, so you're honoring him for being a pawn of history, for being used by forces he didn't understand to attain ends he would have hated. Where's the honor in that? Is there anything you actually respect in the man and find worthy of praise for its own sake and not because of things that coincidentally resulted from it? And if you had this conversation with someone who was on top of his game, secularly speaking, I can make a good guess at the answer you might hear. What I respect about Luther as a man is he was brave. He had the courage of his convictions. He didn't back down when he was threatened by bullies. He spoke truth to power. And we could say, truth, really? And they would say, well, truth as he saw it. Everyone claims to respect truth, and everyone wants it spoken to power. But as Pontius Pilate infamously asked, what is truth? So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. If there are Bible verses that have seen as much abuse and have been forcibly kidnapped and bent toward perverse ends, as much as Luther's legacy has been, and there are, this is one of them. We've all heard it quoted by religious leaders and political leaders, maybe by members of the press, and we've seen it printed, often on the letterhead or the official seal of a school or a university. But not the whole verse, right? It's always just, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And that's not just because it's punchier and more quotable that way, and it fits better on the seal. When you leave out the connection to abiding in my word and being Jesus' disciples, then you can apply it to a whole other range of situations. You have heard at least some of the following. Education lifts people out of poverty. You can understand your world and get a good job. Know the truth, and the truth will set you free. The electorate needs to be well informed about the issues and behavior of their leaders so that they can use their vote to actually hold them accountable. You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And it's used also in more ironic ways, farther from its original meaning. Young people and people in developing countries need to be educated about family planning and STDs so they can take charge of their fertility and protect themselves and don't end up with 12 kids or AIDS. Know the truth, and the truth will set you free. But these are all very selective applications of Jesus' words, aren't they? It's not just that the context has been removed, along with the first half of what he said, they're also cherry-picking the situations and quoting this as if it's an obvious truth, but only in situations where it actually seems to make sense. That is, only when broader knowledge and a better understanding of your options actually does make you more free. But truth is much broader than that. Let's say you have inoperable cancer. When a doctor informs you of that, he is telling you the truth. But is he making you free? You might argue that he kind of is, because now that you know, you'll be able to use the time remaining to you in a more intentional way. 
But that's a very poor sort of freedom, very relative. That's not the kind of freedom that people fight and die for or celebrate. What if a loved one has died in an accident? If someone tells you that, he is also telling you the truth. But is he making you free? You might try to argue that he's making you freer than you would be if uh, for some reason everyone tried to hide the facts from you. But that's a much weaker justification than the last one. People are not freed by tragic news. They're crushed. And they're imprisoned by guilt, which they then have to escape. Uh, grief, I mean, that they have to escape. And even harder to argue around than the above examples, what if someone reveals to you that you are under some kind of guilt or responsibility that you didn't know about previously? The playboy bachelor finds out that he's fathered a child with some woman that he barely remembers. Does that make him feel freer than he was before? A woman finds out that some juicy gossip that she told, which was highly speculative and unwise, has broken up a marriage or lost somebody their career. Does the truth set her free? Maybe someone would try to argue it sets them free to do the right thing. But that's just an abuse of language now. These cords of responsibility, of guilt, of regret, they're anything but freeing. They bind you. They make demands on you. They coerce and force and shame you. And finally, what if God sends a prophet or a pastor or a parent or a friend or even just his book and that messenger tells you that you have sinned? And we're not just talking about special cases where your actions had ramifications beyond what you could have predicted. We're talking about everything that you do and everything that you think and everything that you are in your heart of hearts that nothing is pure, that the best things you have are tainted, that you love yourself more than you love anything else, and that if you were left to your own devices, you would hate and fear God, whom you must love. Because God expects of you things you don't want to give and demands a perfection of life that is the harder, the harder you try to render it the more you realize it's out of your reach. And this messenger tells you you have sinned and that God is going to punish you. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight since through the law comes knowledge of sin. Knowledge of sin. Knowledge is truth. But does this truth set you free? Absolutely not. It compels you to make things right. It goads you to atone for your misdeeds, even though you would need a time machine to fix most of them. And it fills you with fresh guilt and terror every time you wimp out and return to the easy muck instead. You lie there and you yell at yourself, why are you here again? What are you doing here? You aren't going to live forever, you know. And the judge is waiting. And who will you pray to to save you from this judge? This judge is God himself. So what did Jesus mean when he said the truth will set you free? Well, let's look at the rest of what he said. If you abide in my word, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Jesus isn't saying that all truth frees. He's saying that the truth of his word frees. But we might say, well, isn't the law part of his word, and the law is what condemns me? Yes, it is. And Jesus also will be the judge at the end of the world. But that's not all he is. And that's not the only word he speaks. See two verses later. Everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. 
the Son remains forever. So if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. The knowledge of the law teaches us that we are slaves to sin. If we are slaves, we will not remain in the house of the Lord forever. But there is another way. We can be sons. Because Jesus is the Son. And he came to earth to save us, to make us also the children of God. And if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. This is the freedom Jesus was talking about just two verses earlier in that oft-abused quotation. It is not universally true that all truth makes you free, but the Son of God does make you free, and he does so through his word, and his word is truth. Not the condemning word, but the word that he went to the cross in order to make true. The word that you heard from my own unworthy lips just earlier this hour. I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. That name has been given you in your baptism. You are no longer slaves but sons of God because God put forward Jesus Christ as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. Because of that, all your sins have been propitiated. That is, they have been atoned for as perfectly as if Jesus had taken that time machine and gone back and undone all the mischief that you were responsible for. That is how clean your record is before God when he looks at you as you are in Jesus Christ, baptized into Christ. And because you receive that promise by faith, you have peace with God and the righteousness of God and God's own life to share with him forever. This is the truth that sets free. Not in any relative way that you have to squint to see, but absolutely. Free from guilt, free from death, free from hell, free from this whole world with all of its constraints and sorrows. This is the truth that Martin Luther articulated so well and fought for so hard. And that's why we celebrate today. Because God used this misunderstood man to see the truth of our epistle reading and explain the misunderstood gospel reading to us so that we could understand how we are free, how it is that Christ makes us free, how it is that the church's one foundation is Jesus Christ, her Lord, who has redeemed me, a lost and condemned person, purchased and won me from all sin, from death and from the power of the devil, not with gold or silver, but with his holy, precious blood and with his innocent suffering and death, that I may be his own and live under him in his kingdom and serve him in everlasting righteousness, innocence, and blessedness, just as he is risen from the dead, lives and reigns to all eternity. This is most certainly true. In the name of Jesus, amen. amen.